Issue 14. Money. When I was young, I had no money and was very happy because people gave me many things. Therefore, my lack of money did not bother me. When I got older, my parents gave me an allowance, so I finally had some money. But the having of money bothered me because I never had enough of it. Desire always exceeded allowance. My begging and complaints did little to expand parental generosity. So the only thing to do, of course, was to go to work and make more money. I must admit that my salary vastly outdistanced my allowance, but it did not take long to learn that my paycheck and my bank account were altogether different things, the one being so much smaller than the other. Most of the money I made immediately went into other pockets than my own, for rent, for utilities, for food, for insurance, for car payments, and so forth including helping my parents out with their growing age-related expenses. That state of affairs continued for a long time. Even though I kept making larger sums, I never had much to show for it, as my living expenses grew faster than my raises. Before long, I was giving free food, clothes, toys, and snacks to my own children. Not long after that, I started on the allowance treadmill with them. Oh, how I loved them and wanted to make them happy. And oh, how I hated to hear my kids complain about how stingy their allowances were. And somehow, I still had to feed and clothe them and send them to school, while also providing for my own parents. And then the grandchildren joined the gravy train. When I was young, I had no money and was very happy. Comprehension 1. Do you think the writer is rich, poor, in the middle, or is his status irrelevant? Explain your answer. 2. What is the difference between a paycheck and a bank account? 3. From the context, what do you think a gravy train is? Express yourself. 1. Define money in a simple, single word or a few words. 2. How does money make people happy or sad? 3. What qualities must a person have to make a lot of money? 4. How much do you save a month? For what purpose? 5. What advice can you give about good ways to save money? 6. Do you intend to bequeath all your money to your children? 7. What can you say about how to teach children how to spend money? 8. Should kids be rewarded with extra money when they do what is expected of them? 9. Have you ever given money to charity? If not, why not? If so, what charities did you contribute to? And why did you do it? 10. Do you ever give money to panhandlers on the street? Why or why not? 11. How powerful do you think money is? 12. Is anything more important than money? If so, tell us what it is. 13. Do you think money can buy love? If so, how? If not, why not? 14. Who takes care of your family finances? 15. Do you get a budgeted allowance or allotment every month? How much is it? Is it enough? 16. Does a credit card merely give its possessor more convenience, or does it just encourage extra, unnecessary spending? 17. Have you ever gotten a loan from a bank? Was it hard or easy to get? Was the repayment easy or hard? 18. Have you ever borrowed money from relatives or friends? Did you give them some interest when you paid them back? 19. Have you ever lent any money to anyone? Did you have any problems getting it back? Would you take a friend to court if you couldn't get your money back? 20. Have you ever lost a large amount of money for any reason? What were the circumstances? Opinion Samples 1. Money is the most powerful thing in the universe, except maybe God.
People and corporations with enough money can immediately gratify every desire and gain any objective. Money finances the arts and technological advancement and funds hospitals and worthy causes. Wealth can buy degrees and accolades, win elections, corrupt governments and courts, overthrow nations. Despite what the moralists claim, money indeed buys respect and prestige, and at least the trappings of love, as a wise man once said, money can't buy love, but it can rent it. 2. Money is just a convenience to make it easier to transfer one commodity or service from one person to another, but it has no intrinsic value of its own. For that reason, everything is more valuable than money. The qualities that define the best aspects of humanity – love, trust, duty, courage, idealism, loyalty, independence of spirit, self-sacrifice, faith, hope, progress, optimism, forgiveness, humor, desire for justice, the appreciation of beauty in its many forms – all of these are so far beyond the scope of money that there is no basis for comparison. Dialogue. What are we really paying for? I feel pretty good today. Why is that? I just had to sign a few pieces of paper and I made a lot of money. Isn't that enough to make anyone happy? Hmm. I put in a full day's work doing what I usually do and I didn't make any extra money at all. But I'm satisfied. I enjoy my work and my job provides my family with all the necessities. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'm glad it makes you happy. But you should know that it took a lot of hard work and long days and nights and enormous personal sacrifice along the way for me to get to the point where I can do what I did today. That wasn't easy. I don't understand. Maybe I can explain with an example. Some famous painter, Whistler I think, was commissioned to paint somebody's portrait. When the patron complained about the cost, Whistler told him that he was not being paid for the few hours it would take to do the painting itself, but for the decades of training and practice it had taken to achieve the necessary skills to do it at all. And so the patron was getting an enormous bargain. That's a good story. I want to remember it. But there are a few people, Whistler, you, a small number of others, who have the innate ability and ambition to reach a position that will ever allow them to capitalize on their own skill sets and labor. I know. Most painters can barely make a living, although dealers often do very well selling their pieces, usually after the painters themselves have died. Even great poets can seldom support themselves with their craft, and either have to beg or get a real job. Police, soldiers, firefighters are all well-trained, dedicated professionals who often subject themselves to grave danger, but they are not high-income earners. Teachers, nurses, social workers are among the lowest-paid professionals in the world, Monks and nuns work for free. This doesn't seem fair. Even more unfair, perhaps, are the people who get handsomely paid just to play. You know, athletes, singers, models. They don't actually do anything constructive, but become quite wealthy. Not all of them, of course. We just don't pay much attention to the ones who are not celebrities and superstars. But even though I just criticized them for the injustice of their riches, I have to put their situation in context. There is a public that is eager to pay for the entertainment they provide, whether that is on the football field or the concert stage or the catwalk. So if the performers did not get this money, someone else, the owner of the team, the record company executive, the advertiser would. Much like the painter and the art dealer. Exactly. Questions 1. Is there any equitable way to share the world's wealth? Describe it or explain why it is impossible. 2. If a person without formal credentials can do a job as well or better than one with the proper certifications, should there be any difference in payment? 3. Is there any reason why age, gender, class, race, ethnicity, nationality, or religion should affect equal pay? Take each category in turn and discuss the pros and cons. Read and discuss. Would you like to bet? No one enjoys paying taxes, though they may enjoy the roads, schools, medical care, protection, and so forth that their taxes pay for. But many people willingly pay a self-imposed voluntary tax called the lottery. 
Many of them actually pay more for lottery tickets than they pay in actual taxes, and very few of them gain any benefit from doing so. Lotteries are inefficient and relatively expensive compared with broad, essentially universal taxes on incomes, for example. And like sales and excise taxes, they are regressive, meaning that the ability to pay is not a factor. Whereas a progressive tax, again, for example, on incomes, may have rates that are higher on those who are better off financially. Most economists condemn lotteries as ineffective methods of revenue collection, and moralists often condemn them as a form of gambling. But more and more, governments are turning to them to help balance their books, because they are easy for legislators to support, and the problems they cause are either too abstract to easily comprehend, or too distant to worry about now. Nevertheless, gambling, including lotteries, is a recognized form of addiction. If governments would insist on performing the roles of drug dealer and enabler, wouldn't they bear the responsibility for treating the addicts they support and help create? The same should be true for encouraging gambling. Questions 1. In your opinion, what's wrong with a voluntary tax? Isn't that more democratic than an involuntary system? 2. Do you regularly, occasionally, rarely, or never buy lottery tickets? What determines your level of participation? Have you paid more into the lottery than you've gotten out of it? 3. Supporters of lotteries point out that participants are actually buying hope in the realization that they can never earn enough or save enough on their own to get the things they desire. What is your opinion of this claim? Let's talk funny. Investment banking reform. Now is the time to reform investment banking. But is it even possible? What do you mean? Investment bankers are infamous for their relentless greed and for putting their own interests over their clients. That's the very nature of investment banking, and every investor knows that. That's why people think they can get rich there. You mean they know the system is rigged, but they don't complain as long as they think they can get rich by themselves cheating other people? That's about the size of it. Then I think now is the time to reform people, not just the system. Questions 1. Are there sound, honest investment opportunities? Explain your answer. 2. Can honest people ever get rich? Why or why not? 3. Is it in the best interest of governments and politicians to closely regulate financial markets or to allow them to do whatever they like? Justify your response. Points to ponder. The following sentences are all related thematically. They express a wide difference of opinions and attitudes. You may agree with some of them and disagree with others. Please discuss what you think the sentences mean and what you think about them. 1. Too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't want in order to impress people they don't like. 2. When I was young, I thought that money was the most important thing in life. Now that I am old, I know that it is. 3. The lack of money, not the love of it, is the root of all evil. 4. Anybody who thinks money is everything has never been sick. 5. Married men can't understand why every bachelor isn't a millionaire. 6. One's character is put to a severe test when one suddenly acquires or quickly loses a considerable amount of money. 7. It's a kind of spiritual snobbery that makes people think they can be happy without money. 8. Men make counterfeit money. In many more cases, money makes counterfeit men.